We know from the Quran and the Sunnah that there is something called a ruh inside of us or a soul inside of us. I find it very interesting that all the major faiths without exception, they believed in the concept of the human soul. The ancient Chinese, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Christians, the Sikhs, the Muslims, the Abrahamic religions, even the Greek philosophers, Plato and Socrates, and they're not even connected to a wahi. The ruh is something that permeates through all of human civilization. And of course, Allah mentions this in many verses. They ask you, what is the human soul? Tell them, the ruh is from the matters of Allah, and you have not been given anything of knowledge except a very, very small amount. What made Adam Adam was the ruh. Before the ruh, Adam was fashioned clay. Allah says in the Quran, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ After I fashion him, then I blow my ruh into him. Then prostrate down to him. And the Prophet ﷺ tells us that when Allah fashioned Adam from clean, he left the body there. And Iblis came and began looking at this empty vessel. And he began knocking on the vessel. So Iblis is doing that to the body of Adam. Adam is not alive yet. And Iblis entered and exited from this shell. And he snorted and said, eh, anything that I can enter and exit from, I can control. And he felt he is better than Adam. The Prophet ﷺ tells us that when Allah blew the ruh into Adam, he blew from the top down. And when it reached the nostrils of Adam, it tickled the nostrils. Adam sneezed. And by that time, the ruh is reaching the mouth. And so even before the ruh is going to the body, Adam subconsciously, Adam says, Alhamdulillah. It comes from the fitrah. And Allah Azza wa Jal responds, Yarhamukallah. So the first phrase that our Lord said to the first man, Yarhamukallah, Ya Adam. And the Prophet said, the ruh continued to go down until it reached the hands of Adam. Before it got to his foot, Adam tried to get up, but he couldn't because the ruh has not yet reached down there. And Allah Azza wa Jal said, خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَجَلِ How hasty is man? You have no patience. Allah Azza wa Jal created a ruh and that ruh was blown into Adam. The ruh is not Allah, a'udhu billah. Adam does not have, a'udhu billah, divinity. Adam is makhluq. The ruh is makhluq. Anytime Allah ascribes something to himself, Allah wants to honor this object by saying, this is mine, my abd, my Rasul, Rasulullah, my house, my camel, my ruh. It doesn't mean, a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah, that a bit of Allah entered Adam, a'udhu billah. Adam's ruh was created directly by Allah. And as an honor to Adam, Allah Azza wa Jal, He blew the ruh directly into Adam. And Adam becomes the human being. Now, where does our ruh come from? Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِن بَنِي آدَمَ مِن ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ Remember when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took from the children of Adam, from their backs, that He took their progeny. And وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ He caused them to be witnesses against themselves. We learn from the hadith as follows, that when Adam came down to this earth and Allah Azza wa Jal accepted his repentance, we learn from our tafsir literature that this acceptance took place in Arafat. Some of the tabi'oon said this. One thing we know for sure from the hadith, once Adam's tawbah is accepted, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rubbed the backbone of Adam. And from the backbone of Adam, he extracted every single soul that would be in existence until Qiyamah. Where was Adam's soul created? Up there. Who created it? Allah directly created it from there. From what? We have no idea. Where was our soul created? In this earth it was created. From what? From the backbone and we can say from the soul of Adam. And this is what the Quran is mentioning. وَإِذْ أَخَذْ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمِ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ From the ظُهُور, from the backbone, from the sulb. The hadith uses the word مِنْ أَصْلَابِهِمْ Right? The sulb. What is sulb? Sulb is the backbone. Allah extracted from the backbone and from the soul every single soul that would ever be born until Qiyamah. We were born in Arafat. Our spiritual birth, our physical birth where our mothers gave birth to us. But our ruh was born in Arafat. This is in the hadith. And this ruh, it existed without a body. And the ruh then, the Quran tells us that, أَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ 
he caused these arwah to witness against themselves. And Allah speaks directly to the souls. And what was the question? Alastu bi rabbikum. Don't you know I am your Rabb? And what did we all respond? The Quran says, Bala. Yes, O oh Allah, you are our Lord. So how are the souls expected to know when there is no wahi, there is no prophet, there is no ayat at tadabbur? How are they expected to know? Response, the fitrah that Allah created the soul with. The Prophet said, He scattered all of these souls in front of him. Allah scattered all of these souls. How many souls? Every single one. We were there. And he then took the covenant. This soul, it remains in a state that we don't have any idea about until the next reference. And that next reference, Hadith in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He coagulates the creation of the fetus inside of the womb of the mother until finally a certain number of days pass. Then the angel comes with the ruh and the angel blows the ruh into the fetus. Who blew the ruh into Adam? Allah Azza wa Jal. Who will blow the ruh into us? The angel. And that is when the fetus takes on a living status. One final hadith inshallah. And that is the hadith in Sahih Bukhari. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, the souls are like groups of armies or battalions of armies lined up. So the souls that know one another, they become friends. And the souls that there's nakara, there's not getting along. There's something that ikhtalaf, they have ikhtilaf. This is a very deep hadith and scholars have interpreted in different ways. Some of them have said that let's just understand this hadith as being from this dunya, not pre-dunya. And that some souls get along with other souls. And when the soul gets along with the other soul, the two bodies get along and they become friends and life is good. And some souls don't get along with other souls. And when that happens, they're not friends, they're enemies. And that's a valid interpretation. However, a number of ulama, they go even deeper than this. And this is very profound and Allah knows best. And they say, perhaps in this world, before this world, when the souls were all together, some souls became friendly with one another. And when they find themselves in this dunya, automatically they become friendly in this dunya as well, because they were friendly in there as well. And some souls didn't get along over there. And so in this dunya as well, when they discover one another, they don't get along. The wording allows for this interpretation. And subhanAllah, I have to say, Wallahi, it's so amazing that sometimes you meet a person for the first time and within a 10, 15, 20 minute conversation, you know, oh, this person I will get along with very well. And sometimes you will meet somebody for 10, 20 times. And yeah, it's okay. Salaam alaikum as -salam, good enough. How do you know instantaneously? This hadith tells us there's something that is beyond and that is something that the souls go back to. Al-Bara ibn Azib said that once we attended the janazah of somebody and we followed the grave up until the qabr and the qabr had not yet been dug. So all of us sat down with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and somebody began to dig the qabr. Now that's going to take a while. So Al-Bara ibn Azib said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam looked up to the heavens and then he looked down to the earth. He looked up to the heavens, he looked down to the earth and then a third time he looked up to the heavens and then he looked down to the earth. Then he said, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adhab al-qabr. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the adhab of qabr. Then he began the hadith. When the Muslim is about to enter the next world and leave this dunya, the malakul maut comes and every single soul has a specific malakul maut assigned to it. Because Allah says in the Quran, bikum. Then the malakul maut that has been assigned to you will take your soul. So the malakul maut comes and sits at his head. Then the angels of the heavens come down as if their faces are suns, bright. And they have with them the shrouds of Jannah and the perfumes of Jannah. When the person is about to pass away, Allah sends a delegation of angels just for him. 
This delegation varies from person to person. The one who prays tahajjud and was abid and zahid is not like the one who barely just prayed the five salawat and just about made it. Everyone has a daraja from where they go. The one who is righteous will get a more noble delegation and larger delegation and they will sit as far as the eye can see. You are the center of attention and you are surrounded by millions and all of them, they are bringing peace and comfort with their presence. Their faces are shining bright. You can smell the fragrances of Jannah. Then the angel of death will say, أَيَّتُهَمْ نَسْهُ الْمُطْمَئِنَّ أَخْرِجِي إِلَى مَغْفِرَةِ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانِ O pure and peaceful soul, now is the time to exit. He is taking it in such a gentle manner. He is inviting the soul. Come, come out now. You beautiful soul, you pure soul, come out. And I welcome you to Allah's maghfirah and Allah's pleasure. So the Prophet wasallam said, his soul will exit and just go out. His soul will flow out like water flows out from a jug. This is how the soul will exit and it will then reach the angel of death and the angels around it. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, they will not allow the soul even one second to be unattended. They will take it up to the heavens immediately. Interesting by the way, the body we shroud it, but the soul, the angels shroud. And the angels will wrap it in the delicate cloths of Jannah. And they will put the perfumes of Jannah on it. And every time they were going up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will pass by other angels. And the angels will say, who is this beautiful soul? And the angels will respond, this person is Fulan ibn Fulan. And they'll mention him by the best names that the people of earth remembered him by. Anybody who said, oh, you're an honest person. The angels will say, this is Fulan ibn Fulan, the honest person person. The best descriptions that the people gave of him, the angels will give as they're going upwards. And this also shows us another fact that we all know. And that is that the heavens are chock full or jam packed of angels. And those angels don't know who this soul is. So they'll say, who is this? And they will recognize this soul to be a beautiful soul. How so? Because of the angels of mercy and the angels that have the perfume of Jannah and the kafan of Jannah. So the other angels will recognize, oh, this is a good person. So they'll say, who is this good person? And so the entourage will say, this is so-and-so, the son of so-and-so. And then they will mention him with all of the beautiful names that he was mentioned with in this world. And then they reach the highest heavens, the doors of the heavens are opened up for him and they go higher and higher until they get to the highest heavens the seventh heaven then it will be said who will say this in other reports Allah will say write his name in the register of Illiyin. And Illiyin is the name of a register for the righteous people. It is mentioned in the Quran. And it means the highest register. That is where the highest book is written for the righteous people. And then Allah will say, return my servant to this world because I created them from it and I shall return them to it and then I shall bring them back from it one other time. And so his ruh will be returned to his jasad and then their souls reunite with their bodies. Now obviously the reuniting with the body, it is not the reuniting of this world, nor is it the reuniting of the Akhirah. It is a completely different reuniting, which we do not know is beyond our ilm. In the Alimul Barzakh, not necessarily in our dunya, in a different dimension. Then two angels will come and they will ask him the questions. This is Munkar and Nakir. The names do not occur in this hadith, but in other hadith they occur. And they ask him, Mar Rabbuk? He says, Allah. They say, Ma Dinuk? He says, Islam. They say, who was this man that was sent amongst you? And when they say this man, then the person will automatically understand the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He will say, Rasulullah. He is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he says this, they will say to him, how do you know all of these answers? He will say, I read the book of Allah, I believed in it, and I affirmed it to be true. Then a voice will call from the heavens, Ansaddaq, he has spoken the truth. فَأَفْرِشُوهُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ وَأَلْبِسُوهُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ وَأَرَوْهُ مَنْزِلَهُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ so once again, Allah will decree. He has spoken the truth. So give him the clothes of Jannah and give him the couches of Jannah and show him his place in Jannah. There's no food, there's no drink. 
because it is barzakh. But there is comfort of the barzakh. Give him the cushions of Jannah and give him the libas of Jannah. Okay, you put something on the soul and show him his house in Jannah. So the person will have his grave made vast. His grave as large as he can see and a portal will open up and that portal will be facing his house in Jannah and he will see his house in Jannah and he will smell the fragrance of Jannah and he will hear the sounds of Jannah and so he will say oh Allah hasten judgment day make it quick so that I can enter this house and as he's waiting there a very handsome entity comes that is bright that is wearing good garments that has good clothes and that entity will say I've come to give you glad tidings rejoice and be happy for this is the day you were promised the man will say and who are you for by Allah you are nothing but good your presence is good your face is good you are bringing good news and so he will say I am your good deeds coming back so your good deeds will take on a form that will bring you happiness, will give companionship to you in the grave. And that person will then continue to make dua to Allah. And then the Prophet wasallam said, this is what Allah says in the Quran. Allah thabbata means to make firm. Allah comforts and makes firm. Allah gives thabat to the people who believe. With what? thabit. With the firm statement in this world and in the next world. What is al qawl thabit? Our scholars said al qawl thabit is in this world. You say la ilaha illallah at the time of death. May Allah make our last kalima to be la ilaha illallah at the time of death and in the next world when munkar and nakir come you answer these questions who gives you the confidence to answer when you've just been returned to the qabr allah gives you that confidence the prophet sallallahu said as for the kafir or the fajr when he is about to leave this world and enter the next world the malakul maut comes and he is surrounded by angels of a gloomy disposition of a scary disposition and they surround him as far as the eye can see the worse the person the more frightening the delegation so the death of Fir'aun is not going to be like the death of an average person who rejected Islam as far as the eye can see there will be deadly angels angels that terrify and the malakul maut will say you filthy soul get out of your body and meet allah's ghadab and meet allah's anger and the prophet said so the soul will exit like an iron comb is pulled through wet wool the soul is not happy to leave so the soul will be snatched away in the most vicious manner imaginable and there will be angels that have from the kafan of Jahannam, a'udhu billah, the coals of Jahannam, the stench of Jahannam. And they will wrap the body, so already the adab begins. And they will pass by every group of angels. And the angels will say, who is this filthy or dirty soul? Because they see who's around. And what adjectives will they use? The adjectives that the people used in this dunya against him. Oh, you volume, oh, you cheat, oh, you liar, double-faced hypocrite. Those adjectives, they will not be forgotten. Allah has written, the angels have written, and now it will be used against the person. A'udhu Billah. When they are terrified, their terror will only increase. And the doors of the heavens will be shut and not opened up. And then the voice will come, write his name in Sijin. And Sijin is the registrar of Jahannam. Sijin is where the names of Jahannam are written. Take his body back to this earth because I promised them from it I created and to it they shall return and from it I shall bring them back a third time. And then the Prophet recited the verse. Whoever commits shirk with Allah, it is as if he is falling from the heavens and it is as if the birds are plucking at his flesh or the wind is taking him hither and thither. This ayah indicates the falling of the soul. Then the Prophet said, his soul will be thrown back into his jasad. And then the angels will come and say, He will say, Ha, ha, la adri. Like, I don't know then they will say madinuk ha ha la adri who is this man sent amongst you i do not know and allah will say he has lied now why has he lied because he did know in this dunya and he refused to accept 
in his mind he knew, but his body did not worship Allah. So his body is answering, I don't know, but his mind knew Allah is my Lord. When they say, who is this man? This is for the one who knew the Prophet ﷺ and rejected him. The one who knew Islam, Abu Lahab, for example, he will say, ha ha la adri. Allah will say, he's lying. He knew and he didn't follow. So the lying is to the one who rejects Islam consciously. And then the angels are told, put around him the shroud of Jahannam and bring from him the smoke of Jahannam and allow him to look at his place in Jahannam. So the portal will open up and the portal will show him his place in Jahannam. Then the qabr will become dark and dank and surround him until his rib cages break and enter into each other. And then as he is there being punished, an entity comes to him who is terrifying to behold with the worst stench. Just his presence is odious. And he says, woe to you, who are you? And of course the response is, I am your deeds coming back to you. And the man will make dua to Allah. Ya Rabb, do not allow judgment day to occur. Ya Rabb, delay the judgment day. Because this is just the beginning. It is painful enough, but he knows what will happen is even worse than this. There is a very terrifying hadith in Sahih Muslim. Anas ibn Malik said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam say, were it not for the fact that you would stop burying your dead, I would have made dua to Allah that you hear the adab al-qabr that I am able to hear. We are being told, if we could hear adab al-qabr, we would stop burying our dead. What are the specific causes of adab al-qabr that are mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah? Number one, which is the most obvious one, the kafir. And category two, which is the munafiq. These are the only two that are mentioned in the Quran. There is no reference whatsoever of the adab al-qabr for the believer in the Quran. We only learn this from the sunnah. Now, the fact that the Quran only mentions adab al-qabr for the kafir and munafiq, and it is the hadith that mentions adab al-qabr for some of the sinful, just from this, inshallah, we can derive that the adab al-qabr for the believer is not to the level, not to the severity of the adab al-qabr for the kafir and the munafiq. Number three, the number one issue mentioned for the believer, not cleaning after using the restroom. Our Prophet ﷺ passed by two qabrs next to him and he said, these two are being punished, but they are not being punished for big things. Then he said, no, they are big things. As for one of them, he would not protect himself from his own urine. And the other version says, he would not allow his urine to basically finish. And so it would drop out and would leave Najasa over there. And in the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim, our Prophet ﷺ said, the majority of Al-Adab Al-Qabr comes from urine. Why is this such a big deal? Because it indicates a complete and utter carelessness about Tahara. And tahara is the key to salah. And salah is the pillar and the crux and the backbone of all good deeds. So when a person becomes lax about tahara, this is a frame of mind that he's lax about salah. And when you're lax about salah, what do you expect then? If it so happens that you are forced to use the restroom in a public area and you're not able to purify yourself in the proper manner. In this case, make sure that you're able to get home and change your clothes and wash yourself before salah. So to be in a state of a little bit of najis on your clothing temporarily, that is not going to cause you any sin. The sin is to pray in that state. Number four, the same hadith of the two that he passed by two people in the grave. They're being punished for some things that are not big, rather they are big. As for one of them, he would not protect himself from the boat. As for the other, he would be walking between people with namima. Now, in both of these cases, these two people were habitual in what they did. The adab al-qabr is not for the one-off from the hadith. He made it his lifestyle. He was known to be tattletale. And what is namima? Namima is to hear something that is said about someone in one gathering and then to go tell him with the intention of making problems, causing issues between him and the other person. So you're in one gathering and something was said that should not have been said. And that's basically ghiba. The ghiba is bad, it's haram enough. But if the ghiba remains in that room, the damage is internal. When the ghiba is taken back to the person, this is called namima. And namima is worse than ghiba because namima is what ends up doing the damage. 
As for riba in and of itself, that is haram. And you know what Allah says about it in the Quran. And the sin is between the person and Allah. But if that riba remains in that room, then it's not going to destroy the bonds. Namima is tattletaling the riba back to that person. And this is obviously haram. Number five, in one version of the hadith, or a similar hadith, or a different one, we're not sure exactly. Our Prophet ﷺ mentioned that he passed by two graves. And he said, as for the other one, he was somebody who would do riba. And Ghiba and Namima are two circles that overlap. Every Namima has to have a Ghiba. And in that hadith, he put two branches in the graves. And he said, as long as these branches are moist, their adha will be lifted up for them. The sixth point, kibr or arrogance and pride. Hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Our Prophet ﷺ said, there was once a man who was walking in a cloak of finery, in a cloak that he's boastful and arrogant about, impressed with himself having combed his hair finely, walking about yatabattar. It means he has kibr in him. He thinks he is it, right? And as he's walking around with that sense of pride, Allah caused the earth to open up and swallow him. And he will continue to be swallowed and descending until qiyamah. Until qiyamah means where is he being punished? In the qabr. So the one who had kibr in his heart, a'udhu billah, the one who had arrogance, this person as well, he has the potential to be subjugated to adab al-qabr. Number seven, wailing over the dead. Umar ibn Khattar radiallahu anhu, when he was stabbed and he was bleeding to death and he was taken to his room and the doctor said to him, Halas, we cannot save you. One of the companions, Suhaib, Ar-Rumi entered in and he began to cry and he said wa akha wa sahiba oh what a tragedy this is oh how am i going to live after this oh the loss of a noble brother umar ibn khattab radiyallahu an while he's bleeding to death he literally has a few hours left he says oh suhaib are you crying over me and don't you know that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the dead person is punished. The mayyit is punished for some of the crying that the people do over him. So he forbade him to wail and cry. Some have said, this is something that the mayyit will be punished for if he made it a habit that in his family, there will be wailing over the dead. And he didn't stop that. So when he dies, then he will be punished. Then why didn't you stop your own family from doing this sin? This is one interpretation. What is wailing? Wailing is not the same as crying. Everybody should know. Our Prophet ﷺ cried multiple times because of death. He cried when he visited his mother's grave, Amina, and his beard became wet. And he cried when his son Ibrahim was about to pass away. Crying is a rahmah that Allah places in the hearts of his servants. This is an authentic hadith. Point number eight, stealing the ghanima of the battlefield. And this is an authentic hadith Bukhari and Muslim in the issue of the battle of Uhud that somebody died on the battle of Uhud and the Sahaba praised him and they said, oh, he died a shaheed. Good luck to him or congratulations to him. And our Prophet said, no, he is being punished right now because the cloak that he stole and didn't declare because you have to declare anything you take, it must be declared. You cannot just hide something in your pocket and go away. This is a type of stealing from the common good. He stole something before he died a martyr. And our Prophet ﷺ said, that cloak that he stole, it is wrapped around him and it is burning him right now in Jahannam. Point number nine, dying in a state of debt. And our Prophet ﷺ would seek refuge in Allah from غَلَبَةُ الدَّيْنِ وَقَهْرِ rijal, From having debt that is overpowering. We should try our best to live debt-free to brothers and sisters. And only take qard if we really need it and ask Allah to help us pay it off immediately. Our Prophet ﷺ said, hadith is in Ibn Majah, the ruh of the mu'min is mu'allaq, is suspended back until his debt is paid off. So our scholars mention, this is a type of adab. His ruh is not in peace. It's not here, it's not there. It's not in its mustaqar, its final place. So the ruh is held back and it is in a state of anxiety until the debt is paid off. When a person's janazah came to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ asked, does he have a debt? Jibreel must have told him because he usually did not ask this. They said, yes, he does. So he said, then I will not pray. Somebody else pray for him. So one of them said, Ya Rasulullah, I will pay off his debt. Can you pray for him? So then he prayed for him. This was to make the point clear to all of us. 
Don't take debt something light. Number 10, 11, 12, and 13. Four of them, they are mentioned in one hadith. And these are eating riba and lying and zina and not praying on time. Samura ibn Judnub narrates that whenever the Prophet prayed Fajr, he would turn around and he would ask us, who amongst you saw a dream last night? And if anybody saw a dream, we would tell him that dream. And so one day he said, instead of asking them, he said, I saw a dream last night. Two men came to me and they took me to Al Ard al Muqaddasa, the holy land. And then he said, I saw a person sitting down and there was a man standing on him and he was hitting him with a scalp or a type of knife and carving one side of the head. Then he would turn the other side and do the same. By the time he did it on the other side, the first side would be cured. So then keep on doing this back and forth. So I said, what is the matter with this man? They said, keep on going. So they kept on going. So we saw another man. He was lying down on his back and another man was hitting him with a rock. And whenever the rock hit him, the rock would roll away. The first man would go after the rock. In the meantime, the first one would be cured. He would then come back and hit him again. I said, what is this? They said, keep on going. And again, he saw a pit of fire in it that was shaped like a cylinder. And there were men and women upside down and there was fire in it and they would come up as the fire went then the fire would come down and they would come down they would go up and down and so on and so forth then he said I saw a person that was at a river of blood and another man was standing on one side and a person in the middle of the river every time that the person came to try to get out of the blood of river he would be hit with a rock so he would be pushed back and this would also be going on and on so I said who is this they said keep on going then we kept on going until I saw a beautiful garden with a large tree in it and there was an elderly man and lots of children around him and there was in front of this man also a fire and they told me to come and I went into this garden and I saw a house it was more beautiful than any house I had seen then at the end he says the Prophet ﷺ said to the two of them you have taken me on a long journey now explain to me what I saw so then the angels explain. As for the one that you saw his head being split, this was the one who would lie about others and his lie would spread everywhere. In other words, this is namima and ghiba and slander, bohtan on top of that. It's hurting the honor of families. It is breaking the marriage of people. So this will be done to him until judgment day. As for the one whom you saw that his head was being crushed open, this was a person whom Allah taught the Quran to, yet he would sleep the whole night and he would not act upon it during the day. And this is going to happen to him until judgment day. And as for the one whom you saw that the men and women were hanging upside down, these are the people of zina. And as for the one you saw swimming in the river of blood, these were the people who ate riba. And as for the old man you saw with children around him, that was Ibrahim. And the children around him were the young kids who passed away without reaching bulugh. You know that in our tradition, Ibrahim and Sarah will take care of any toddler, any infant who has passed away. They will be their caretakers until they're reunited with a Jannah. And as for the house that you saw, that is your house. And as for me, this is Jibreel. And as for him, this is Mikael. So the Prophet wasallam said, can I enter my house? And they said, no, you still have life left in this dunya. When that life is over, then you can enter the house. Then I woke up. Now, this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. It mentions buhtan. It mentions eating riba. It mentions zina. And it mentions the one who knows the Quran but sleeps at night. Now, our scholars say that this is the one who does not wake up for fajr. This is the meaning of sleep the whole night because it is not wajib to pray tahajjud. It's not about tahajjud. It is about sleeping the whole night until the sun comes up means what? He missed fajr. Right? So the one who does not pray fajr. From all of these points, it is correct to extrapolate that any major sin can lead to adab of the qabr. 
how do we protect ourselves from adab al qabr the prophet sallallahu said whoever dies on a friday is protected from the adab of the qabr dying on a friday is a good sign inshallah to be saved from adab al qabr another way to protect ourselves from the adab al qabr asma binti abi bakr narrated from the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that when the person enters his qabr if he is a mu'min his salah and his siyam surround him and the angels of punishment come and the salah push them away and they come from another side and the siyam push it away and the hadith then goes on and as for the kafir nothing can push the angels away of the ways to protect from adab al-qabr memorizing and reciting frequently surat al-mulk and it's only 30 verses brothers and sisters our prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said surah tabarak is the preventer from adab al-qabr if you haven't memorized surah mulk start memorizing it today ibn mas'ud said a person will be brought to his qabr and two men will come to him meaning the angels of punishment will come and when they come to him it will be said or a voice will be heard you have no way to get to this man he would recite surat al-mulk then they will try to come from his chest and it will be said to him, go away. Come to his face, it will be said to him, go away. Come from his top, it will be said to him, go away. And Ibn Mas'ud said, it will prevent from Adab al-Qabr. So how does Surat al-Tabara prevent from Adab al-Qabr? The one who frequently recites it, the one who memorizes it, the one who loves it, the one who recites it in Salah. Not just reading it once or twice, but being frequent in its reading. What else protects us from Adab al-Qabr? Dua. It is narrated that Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas would teach his children this dua the way that the teachers would teach kids alphabet. What dua is this? That he said the Prophet sallallahu taught us after every single salah, we say this dua, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-jubni, wa'udhu bika uradda ila ardha lil-umur, wa'udhu bika min fitna dunya wa'udhu bika min adhaab al-qabr. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from cowardice. I seek refuge in you from living to a senile old age. A'udhu bika min fitna dunya all of the trials of the dunya. And number four, أعوذ بك من عذاب القبر. Abu Bakr narrates that the Prophet would say after every single salah, Allahumma inni a'udhu bik min al-kufri wal-faqri wa adhab al-qabri. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from kufr and from extreme poverty and from adhab al-qabr. Zayd bin Arqam said that I am only teaching you like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us. Allahumma inni a'udhu bik min al-ajzi wal-kasli wal-jubni wal-bukhli wal-harami wa adhab al-qabr. I seek refuge in you from being lazy and from being incapable and from being cowardly and from being stingy and from living to an old age and from adab al-qabr and Aisha said our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would always seek refuge in Allah with this dua again after every salah Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min fitnat al-nar wa min adab al-nar wa min fitnat al-qabr wa min adab al-qabr now you tell me the one who seeks refuge from adab al-qabr five times a day for 50 years of his life Will Allah not accept even one dua once and that's it? Think about that. So brothers and sisters, from now on, after every salah, add this dua. And you can use any of them. Now, how about dua for other people? Yes, dua for other people as well. When our Prophet attended the janazah, he announced to the people, ask forgiveness for your brother and ask Allah to make him firm for the fitna because now he is being asked by the angels. When the burial is taking place and the sand is being put on him, he didn't say go and rush back to your house. He said, now is the time to ask Allah's forgiveness and to ask Allah for thabat because he is being questioned now. So this means when we go attend a janazah, if we want people to make dua for us, we should make dua for others. And what is the Salat al-Janazah dua? Wathil ibn Asqa narrated that the Prophet taught us dua al-Mayyit. And he said, Allahumma inna fulan ibn fulan fi dhimmatik wa habli jiwarik. Oh Allah, this person is now with you and he has left this world and he's in your company. Faqihi min fitnati al-qabri wa adhab al-nar. So therefore protect him from the adhab and the fitnah of the qabr and the nar. When is this dua done? In the janazah and after when the person has gone. This is the least that we can do, especially to those that have a haq over us, our friends, our relatives, our deceased loved ones. The least we can do, we make dua for them by name. We say, oh Allah, protect them from the fitna and the adab of the qabr. And Awf ibn Malik said, I heard the Prophet make the dua in Salat al-Janazah and he said, Allahumma fir lahu warhamhu wa'afihi wa'afu anhu wa'akrim nuzulahu wa wasi'u dkhalahu wa'asilhu bin ma'i wa thalji wal barad wa 
ينقه من الخطايا كما ينقى الثوب الأبيض من الدنس وأبدله دارا خير من داري وأهلا خير من أهله وزوجا خير من زوجه وقيه فتنة القبر وعذاب النار in the salah of the janazah we're supposed to memorize in case you have not memorized this dua in Arabic you are allowed to say it in English or any language because it is a dua it's not the Quran so after the third takbir in case you have not memorized the dua in Arabic don't just stand there and do nothing say it in any language and say oh Allah forgive him make his grave a vast place oh Allah exchange his evil deeds with good deeds oh Allah increase his nur in the qabr oh Allah protect him from the fitna to qabr and protect him from the adab al qabr is the adab al qabr permanent or or will it stop? Ibn al-Qayyim, in his famous book, Kitab al-Ruh, he mentions this issue. And he says, some ahadith seem to indicate that adab al-Qabr will last until judgment day. Then he says, and there are other ahadith that mention that they shall stop after a while. And he says, and this is the case for the sinners of the believers, that they will be punished in accordance with their crimes after which the punishment will stop. And he says, it is also possible that the adab al-qabr will stop because of somebody's dua in this world for the mayyit. And it will stop because somebody gifted sadaqah for the mayyit. And it will stop because somebody made istighfar for the mayyit. And it will stop because somebody did hajj and umrah for the mayyit. And it will stop because somebody read Quran for the mayyit. So he says, these good deeds will act like a shafa'ah and will intercede on behalf of the sinners. So therefore, it appears that it depends on the person. For some people, adab al-qabr will be permanent until the trumpet is blown. And for some people, the adab will not be permanent and it will stop. Can the dead hear the living? When we visit them at the qabr, when we say salam to them, can the dead hear and are they aware of the presence of those who are next to the qabr? Even the sahaba disagreed amongst themselves. Realize that what we're talking about is the issue of the dead hearing in the vicinity of the qabr. No mainstream scholar in the history of Islam ever said that the dead can hear anything and everything. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is as sami and al so we began by the first group of people, those who said they cannot hear. And at the head of this entire group of scholars is none other than our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. Aisha's position is the dead cannot hear. And the evidence she herself used is the Quran itself. And there are a number of verses, three of them, in fact, two are exactly the same verse, but repeated twice. Surah An-Naml verse 80 and Surah Ar-Rum verse 52 are exactly the same. فَإِنَّكَ لَا تُسْمِعُ الْمَوْتَى وَلَا تُسْمِعُ الصُمَّ الدُّعَاءَ إِذَا وَلَّوْ مُدِبِرِينَ you, Ya Rasulallah, cannot make the dead to hear. And those that are yani, deaf, but meaning here arrogant and whatnot, if you call out to them, they're going to turn away. How can you make them hear? So the tafsir is just like the arrogant Quraysh turn away and leave. Allah is saying just like the dead cannot hear, so too the Quraysh will not hear. The third verse, Surah Fatir, verse 22. The living and the dead are not the same. Allah can allow anyone he wants to to hear and you cannot make the one in the qabr to hear. In the other camp or the other group are also many scholars. At the head of them is none other than Umar ibn Khattar radiallahu anh, and his son Ibn Umar and a number of sahaba. And their evidence are many, many, many ahadith. And the most powerful and the most explicit one is the one that occurred when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam buried the dead at the battle of Badr. He buried the mushrik at the Battle of Badr. Anas ibn Malik says that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left the Qabr of the people of Badr for three days. Then on the way back to Medina, he passed by their Qabr and he stopped and nadahum. He shouted out to them, Ya Aba Jahl ibn Hisham, Ya Umayya ibn Khalaf, Ya Utba ibn Rabi'ah, Ya Shayba ibn Rabi'ah. He mentioned the four Sanadid, the four evil leaders of the Quraysh by name. Have you found the promise of Allah true? Because I have found the promise of Allah Allah truth. Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, how can they hear you? How can they respond to you when you're speaking to them? And they have been decayed. They're beginning to decay. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I swear by the one in whose hands is my soul, the Prophet Sallallahu is giving qasam by Allah. You right now are no less able to hear me than they are able to hear me. You can hear me exactly the same as they can. 
the Prophet is saying, I give you qasam. You are hearing me as well as the people in the qabr can hear, but they cannot respond back to me. This evidence is the primary evidence that Umar ibn Khattab and his son ibn Umar used to say that the dead can hear. Of the evidence is, is the hadith in Sahih Bukhari. The Prophet wasallam said, when the person is lowered in the grave and the hadith goes on, then the phrase comes, when his companions go back and leave, the one in the qabr can hear the footsteps of his own companions as they leave. The one in the qabr can hear the footsteps of his ashab when they go back and leave the cemetery. A third evidence, the famous hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, also in Bukhari and Muslim, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Jibreel came and told him to go to the qabr the last week of his life. The famous incident when he left in the middle of the night and Aisha followed wondering he might go into another house if you get my drift here and she's jealous what is going on and he rushes to Baqi' al-Gharqad and Aisha overhears radiallahu anha, what is he saying? And he said the famous that we all know, Assalamu alaykum ya ahla qawmin min al-Muslimin wal mu'min this is the dua that is said when you visit a qabr. Now, how does this indicate that the dead can hear? The scholars say this salam is a salam of tahiyya. Assalamu alaikum, ya ahl al-qubur. And now the Prophet is as if speaking to them. It's just a matter of time, I will meet you. So he is as if speaking to the people of the qabr, and this indicates obviously that they must be hearing them. Evidence number four the mutawatir narration narrated by over 15 of the Sahaba that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that whoever sends his salat upon me, whoever sends his salam upon me, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will convey their salams. And in other versions, Allah Azza wa Jal has angels that are wandering, touring in the land. Their only job is to convey the salams of my ummah to me. So wherever you send salam, the angels bring it to me. Now, this group of ulama, how do they understand the verses that we said are the evidence of group number one. This group understands that when Allah is saying you cannot make the dead hear, the hearing is the hearing of benefit, not the hearing of a physical auditory sensation. And the evidence is the context. Because when Allah calls the Quraysh summun, sum means deaf. They're not actually deaf to the voice. What are they deaf to? The message, the truth, acting upon it. They say the verses are very clear and the context indicates that what Allah is referencing is not the sama' of the ear, but the sama' of the qalb. How does group one interpret the evidences of group two? They say all of these evidences that you have brought forth are exceptions to the general rule. And exceptions don't make a rule. The people of Badr, Allah Azza wa Jal made an exception for them to punish them. And the issue of the footsteps walking away, they say this is at the very instance when the ruh goes back into the body and munkar and nakir, and then after that it finishes. After that it's gone. So they say this is a 15 20 minute exception basically so these are in a nutshell two of the mainstream positions of islam who held each position so as for the position that the dead can hear i believe it is fair to say that a slight majority or maybe even a large majority held this position and at the head of this list is Umar ibn Khattar radiallahu an, and his son ibn Umar and Anas ibn Malik and Abu Hurair radiallahu an. And from the later scholars, you have Imam al-Nawawi, Imam al-Suyuti, Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn al-Qayyim and Ibn Kathir and in recent times as well the famous Mufassir al-Allama al-Shanqiti. Now who's on the other side? We also have some major ulama and beginning with Aisha radiallahu anha herself. And from the Tabi'un Qatada, the student of Ibn Abbas, from the great Ulama al-Bayhaqi, who died 438 Hijrah, Ibn Atiyah, also from Andalus, Ibn al-Jawzi, not Ibn al-Qayyim, Ibn Qudama, also one of the Hanbali scholars, Al-Qadi Abu Ya'la, also one of the Hanbali scholars, and from the Hanafi scholars, Ibn al-Humam and Ibn Abidin, and from the non-Madhabi scholars, Al-Shawkani from Yemen, and in our modern times, the famous Muhaddith Sheikh Al-Albani. Other great scholars, they looked at these evidences and they basically shrugged their shoulders and they said, we don't know. Most famous amongst them, Ibn Abd al-Bar, the famous Andalusian scholar, Ibn Abd al-Bar said, these issues of whether the dead can hear or not, we will never know for certain. We're not going to know it until we're there. And until then, there's no point discussing it. So just let it be. We also need to make a very important disclaimer. 
whether the dead can hear or not, there is no action that is based upon this controversy. Nothing changes in terms of what we do outside of the Qabr. We need to be very clear whether the dead can hear or not. The fiqh of dealing with the dead does not change at all. We do not go to the Qabr and have conversations about life on earth. None of the Sahaba did this with the Prophet wasallam. None of the Tabi'un did it with the Sahaba. Much worse than this is to ask the person in the Qabr to do something for you. Oh, so and so, ask Allah to give me something. Or even worse than this, oh, so and so, you give me something. This is haram. This is a major sin and it is a stepping stone to shirk. Can the dead talk to each other? As Ibn Taymiyyah says, yes, it does appear to be the case. If Allah wills, they can talk and meet one another. And we, of course, have a confirmed narration that the prophets met one another in the night of Isra al Miraj and they are no longer alive. The Prophet was alive, but the rest of them, other than Isa, have gone on and they had conversations with one another, right? And we also have in the authentic narrations that the Prophet said, Musa and Adam had a fight. They didn't have it in this dunya. They had it in Barzakh. So from this, we can say Allah knows best that there is clearly indications that some of the dead can meet some of the dead. Who, when, where, what? As Ibn Abdul Bar says, we will never know until we are a part of that world. What can the living do to benefit the dead? The first three things that are explicitly mentioned. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim, it is authentic. When the son of Adam dies, all of his deeds stop, except for three. Number one, sadaqa jariya. Charity, that is jariya. Jariya means running. Jariya means ongoing. In English, we call it perpetual charity. Any charity that is more than a one-off. You do it and it remains after you have done it. When you build a masjid, as long as people are coming to the masjid, the sadaqa jariya. You build an orphanage, this is sadaqa jariya. It's something that is lasting after you have initially done it. It's not a one-off. Its benefit continues, especially after you die, you're going to be benefiting after it when you are in the grave. Number two, knowledge that people benefit from. The smallest bit to the largest bit. You are dead and somebody benefited from your knowledge then you will be getting that ajr and your body is in the qabr. So whether you taught somebody how to pray, your children how to pray, and now they are praying and you are in the qabr, every time they pray, you will get their reward because you taught them. Giving da'wah is included in this category. Our Prophet wasallam said, Hadith is a Sahih Muslim, whoever calls people to a guidance, shall get the reward of all who follow him without diminishing either's reward. Neither will get lesser reward just because one followed the other. You have a Muslim colleague at work, not very religious, and you become friends, you invite them out bit by bit. Ya khi, let's pray Jum'ah together. And they become more religious inshallah because of your akhlaq and manners. Every single salah that this person does, Allah will bless you with that reward. And the one who prays will get 100% of his own reward as well. And therefore, when the person dies, the first person, the second person's reward will continue to go back. Another hadith that also proves this, whoever introduces into Islam a precedent that is good shall be rewarded with all those who follow that precedent until the day of judgment. And whoever introduces an evil shall be given the sin of all those who did that evil until the day of judgment. Category three, a righteous child making dua for him. The reason why piety is mentioned here is because the point is being given the mother the father invested the time the effort the tarbiyah the mother the father helped in this piety that is a lifelong effort now that the parent has deceased and moved on so now that effort will pay off when we are in the qabr we want all of these three things to be giving our investments need to pay off this is the time to invest dear muslim men and women now we can add to this one other thing that is mentioned in one hadith number four and that is ribat fi sabilillahi azza wa jal. the murabit is the one who technically is guarding the borders of the ummah and it's a very difficult a very lonely very boring job but also very dangerous far from civilization far from family and home it's not easy to do and our prophet said that the one who does ribat and dies in that state he shall be safe from the fitna of qabr and his deed will continue to be written for him until judgment day. Even if he dies a natural death at the post guarding the ummah, then that natural death will not stop the thawab coming in and he will continue to be rewarded until judgment day. Point number five, 5A and B. 5A, dua. 5B, istighfar. 
وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا Those who come after the Ansar and the Muhajirun. They say, رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ Oh Allah, forgive us and forgive our brethren who have come before us. Meaning the ones who have died. This ayah is explicit dua for the deceased. Allah is telling us, make dua for all the Muslims from before you up until the time of the Sahaba. And as well, well, we have so many evidences from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Of them is the Prophet ﷺ going to Baqi' making dua for the deceased. Of them is praying for the deceased in the janazah itself. In fact, what is the Salatul Janazah except dua for the deceased? The dua doesn't need to be in Arabic. The Quran must be in Arabic. The dua can be in any language. Hadith in Abu Dawood, our Prophet ﷺ said, When you pray for the deceased, pray with sincerity. Pray with ikhlas. Loss. Why? Because you will need it when it's your turn. Hadith also in Abu Dawood. After they buried the person, the Prophet ﷺ said, Now is the time to make dua to Allah to make him firm. Now is the time to ask him for thabat, for afiyah, because now he is being asked by the angels. So we make dua for the deceased at any time and in particular at two occasions. Number one, in the janazah, salatul janazah. And number two, right after dafan. Abu Huraira narrated in the Muslim Imam Ahmed, it is mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise the ranks of a rajul salih in Jannah. After his death, obviously. The man will say, Ya Rabb, where is this coming from? What have I done that I'm be getting an upgrade now? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Your child is asking Allah's forgiveness for you. In reality, dua and istighfar are related as we know because istighfar is a category of Dua. dua for the deceased, you ask anything that is needed by the deceased. Make his qabr vast. Make his qabr, in another hadith, lightened. Make him one of the gardens of paradise. What else can we ask? Good companionship, give him good angels. And in particular, the most important dua is istighfar. And that is what, O oh Allah, forgive his sins. O oh Allah, cleanse him the way that a white cloth is cleansed. In another hadith, O oh Allah, substitute his sins with good deeds. Another hadith that mentions dua and istighfar, Abu Asyad mentions, we were sitting with the Prophet ﷺ when one of the Banu Salama tribe arrived. And he said that, O oh Messenger of Allah, is there anything I can do for my parents now that they have died? The Prophet said, Yes. And he mentioned five things. Number one, making dua for them. Number two, istighfar for them. Number three, fulfilling the oaths and covenants that they had after them. If they have a wasiyah, if they have a treaty, if they have anything that they told you to do, now that they're gone, you have to continue doing this. And number four, visiting the relatives that you would not have done except with them. We all have people that are our relatives that we don't have a relationship with them, but our parents did. When the parents move on. The relatives are still there. To visit those relatives that the parents kept in touch with for the sake of the parents. One of my teachers remarked at this. Why? What's going to happen if you visit some person 50, 40 years older than you? You have nothing in common. There's no conversations you had with them, right? Now you go visit. What's the benefit? What will be the only topic of conversation? The deceased. Because that's the one thing in common. Correct? Right? And what will happen when the deceased is mentioned over and over and over again? Istighfar, dua. What's going to happen psychologically? The heart is going to feel comfort and softness as well. The love will be renewed. And then number five, to be generous with their friends. What should a good loving son or daughter do once the parents have moved on or either of the parents have moved on? The Prophet ﷺ gave five things. Number one, you make dua for them. Number two, istighfar. Number three, whatever promise or amana or something, you have to follow that. Number four and five is essentially their circle of friends and relatives. You keep it up. Now we move on to gifting our own good deed. Number six now, sadaqa on behalf of the deceased. Aisha narrates, a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu and said, my mother passed away suddenly. And I feel if she had lived, she would have given some charity. Will she get the ajr if I give sadaqa on her behalf? And the Prophet said, yes. And the hadith is Sahih Bukhari. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, his mother was an Ansariya lady. She embraced Islam and she died in the lifetime of the Prophet So Sa'ad came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, my mother passed away. And I wasn't here when she passed away. I was on a journey. If I give sadaqa on her behalf, will it benefit her? 
So the Prophet ﷺ said, yes. So Sa'ad said, I ask you to bear witness that I give my garden, al-mikhraf, as a charity in her name. Two birds with one stone. Sadaqa jariya for the deceased. And the Prophet ﷺ explicitly allowed it. It appears Sa'ad loved his mother so much, he wasn't even satisfied with this. Because we have another hadith in Sunan Abi Dawud. That Sa'ad ibn Ubadah came back to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, what is the best sadaqa that I can give for my mother? So the Prophet ﷺ said, a well of water. Sa'ad paid some money to dig a well and he said, this is the well for Umm Sa'ad. Number seven, Hajj and Umrah. Ibn Abbas said, hadith is in Bukhari, that a woman from the tribe of Juhayna came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, my mother made a vow to Allah that she would perform Hajj and she passed away without fulfilling the nadhar. May I do Hajj on her behalf? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, let me ask you, if your mother left a debt, would you not repay that debt? She said, yes. So he said, the debt of Allah has more right that you fulfill it back. Do hajj on behalf of your mother. And the Prophet was saying, this is a debt owed to Allah. Okay, what if you fulfill the debt? Now you just want to pay extra. That's not explicit, but there's one narration that is used. And this is the famous one in Abu Dawood that when the Prophet was going for hajj, the Prophet ﷺ was wearing the ihram and a man wore the ihram and said, لَبَّيْكَ عَنْ Shubruma, la bake on behalf of Shubruma. The Prophet ﷺ said, Who is Shubruma? The man said, He is a friend or a brother. The Prophet ﷺ asked this man, Did you do Hajj on behalf of yourself first? He said, No. So now the Prophet ﷺ said, Hujjan nafsik, thumma hujjan Shubruma. Do Hajj on your own behalf and then go ahead and do Hajj on Shubruma. Category 9 fasting. Aisha narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever dies and he had some fast that he had to still do, then his wife Ali should fast on his behalf. And Amr ibn al-As said, Ya Rasulullah, my father al-As ibn Wa'il, before he died, he made another to Allah to sacrifice 100 camels. And my brother Hisham took half of that nadr and the other half is on me. Do I have to do the other 50? Interestingly enough, Hisham and Amr both accepted Islam and the father refused to the end and he did not accept Islam. And our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if only your father had accepted Tawheed, then if you had had fasted and given charity on his behalf, he would have benefited from that. Meaning what? There's no point. Because he didn't die as a Muslim. Now this hadith is quite explicit. Siyam is mentioned here. وَتَصَدَّقْتَ And this is not obligatory per se. It's just he said, I want to give a hundred camels. It would have benefited him. Now let's look at how our scholars of fiqh understood these ahadith. There is a spectrum of opinion when it comes to gifting the good deeds to the deceased and our madhahib. The Hanafi madhab from its beginning has said that any and all good deeds can be gifted to the deceased without any restrictions. In fact, most of them even said, why stop at disease, give them to the living as well. Al-Kasani writes, it doesn't matter whether the one you gift a deed to is alive or dead, you may gift. And it doesn't matter whether you intend to gift before you do the deed, or you make up your mind after the deed has been done, and you decide after it's been done, I'm going to give this deed to the dead. And the Hanafi madhab allows the gifting of any good deed, including salah. And of course, siyam and hajj and Umrah and Qiraat al-Quran, anything and everything can be gifted to anyone else. What did Imam Malik and Imam Shafi'i say? Imam Shafi'i said, other than fulfilling the wajib, such as the guy didn't fast or whatnot, and sadaqa and dua and istighfar, four things. No deed benefits the dead and nothing reaches the dead. Imam Malik himself was on the same madhab as Shafi'i. No gifting. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal was of the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal allowed good deeds to be gifted to the deceased without any restrictions whatsoever. Ibn Qudama is the medieval icon of Hanbalism. And he writes, any good deed that a person does and gives its thawab to a Muslim mayyit, Allah Azza wa Jal will benefit the mayyit because of it. Some ulama said that when you read Quran for the deceased, what the deceased gets is the barakah and the sakina and not the reward. Ibn Qudama says, no, that's not the case. Rather, the deceased gets the thawab. And then he says, and this is ijma' al-Muslimin. 
the unanimous actions of the Muslims in every era and in every land. They come together and they recite Quran and they give the thawab to their dead without anybody criticizing them. Now, what do you think Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al-Islam said? And he's from the Hanbali school. Ibn Taymiyyah and his student Ibn al-Qayyim, they are very, very explicit that all good deeds can be gifted to the deceased. Ibn Taymiyyah writes, It is confirmed that the Prophet ﷺ allowed giving charity for the deceased and he allowed fasting for the deceased. And these evidences and others are used by Imam Ahmad and Abu Hanifa to allow gifting other deeds like the Salah and the Qira'at al-Qur'an to the deceased. However, Ibn Taymiyyah says, it should be known that it is not from the regular customs of the Sahaba and Tabi'un that every time they prayed or every time they read Quran or fast or did Hajj that they would gift their deeds to the deceased or even to their relatives. And indeed, the best method is to follow what the Salaf did. And Ibn Qayyim basically says that out of all of these texts adding to one another, we can prove that the rewards of the good deeds reach the dead when a living person does it for him. And even common sense and qiyas, i.e. rationality proves this point. Why? Because he said, the reward of the good deed, who owns it? The one who has done it. So the one who has done it has the right to gift it to whomever he chooses. Just like in this dunya, if I have some money, don't I have the right to gift it to anybody? Then he mentions explicitly, as for reciting the Quran and gifting it to the deceased without paying, this will reach the dead just like fasting and hajj reaches the dead as well. And I have no problem. You want to say that reciting the Quran is not allowed? This is what Imam Shafi'i said. But don't make the other group mubtadir. Have your position, defend it, and then tolerate a position that goes back to the tabi'un taba tabi'un. That was and still remains a majority of the ummah to this day. I have to say this is the mistake. The mistake is not in the position you want to hold. The mistake is in not allowing another position to have a legitimacy to it. Because this is where we get fractions, fighting, infighting. We have enough problems outside the ummah to be worried about fighting over these issues inside the ummah. Live and let live when it comes to these internal issues and to finish off we've talked about the issue of gifting but do realize when you gift your good deeds to the deceased what you are doing is saying to Allah oh Allah I don't want this good deed anymore give it to somebody else do you go around giving all of your money to somebody else no matter how much you love somebody they'll take some of your money but you keep some for yourself and the more you love them the more you give but you also have rent to pay you also have yourself to take care of when you gift a good deed you are saying if this is the deed oh Allah I don't want it give it to my mother now no doubt you should gift to your mother your father your deceased go ahead whoever needs to be given but you also need a healthy dosage for yourself on Qiyam also you hope that Allah will give you for your generosity can the souls of the living meet with the souls of the dead is there any evidence that the souls of the living interact with the souls of the dead one such evidence the Prophet sallallahu said whoever sees me in a dream has truly seen me because the shaitan does not impersonate me this is an explicit affirmation that the souls of the living can interact with the soul of the Prophet sallallahu evidence number two Isra wal Miraj in this case it wasn't a dream he was in a state of wakefulness but what is the key point here he in interacted with the arwah of the prophets. So these are clear evidences that the people of this world can interact with the deceased. Now, as for the evidences from the stories of the Sahaba and Tabi'un and from the stories of our ancestors and the Salihin and even us, this is something that Ibn Qayyim and others say is tawatarat al-ummah. This is something that every generation mentions without exception. And I am positive even in this audience, we have many people who have interacted with their deceased who have gone on. They have seen them in a dream there are thousands upon thousands of narrations especially when the righteous ulama pass away their students write and they record i saw him in a dream and this happened when you see a relative in a dream me and you the prophet ﷺ said if you see him in a dream shaitan cannot take his form what does this imply 
It implies there is the potential or the possibility that shaitan can deceive somebody and pretend to be someone that the living person knows. Because of this, we say it is possible to see your deceased in a dream. And it is possible the deceased will tell you something of significance or importance, but you cannot base a legal verdict or ruling on what you see in a dream. You cannot change the sharia and it will not hold up even in any court, even in an Islamic court and you are truthful. It doesn't matter. We do not base laws on dreams. No dream can make the haram halal. No dream can make the halal haram. It is in fact possible for the souls of the living in their dreams to meet the souls of the dead. As for while in a state of wakefulness, this does not happen to us. Our Prophet was an exception because he went to Isra al Miraj, and that is a different scenario. We do not interact with the souls of the dead while we are awake. Only when we are asleep because when we are asleep, our souls enter a realm that is one step before the barzakh. And the souls in the barzakh, if Allah wills, they can come out to this interim where our souls are in the dream. There's not some type of ritual that you follow to see somebody in your dream. It doesn't work that way. It is something that happens as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to those whom He chooses. And if you don't see a deceased in a dream, don't read in. There's something wrong. No, there are many righteous who passed away and they don't come in people's dreams. And feel free to act upon them as long as the huquq are being given from the deceased to somebody else, not the other way around, right? If the deceased comes and says, hey, take a hundred dollars from so-and-so. He owes me money. Doesn't work that way. But the other way around, if the haq is for the deceased and against somebody else, right? Now, this is much more easier. Nobody's going to say no when you give a hundred dollars to somebody else. Say, oh, I just want to give this as a gift on behalf of my father. And I know in my own extended circle, what has happened that somebody passed away and he came to his son and said, you know, I owe so-and-so money. And he had money, but he just didn't write a will or something. So the son went to that person and the person said, how did you know? I plan to forgive. When he passed away and the son said, I saw him in a dream and my father told me, give the money to so-and-so. Now again, we don't base our sharia on it, but nonetheless, it is something that we can accept no problem. Do the souls of the dead meet with one another? There is nothing in the Quran that confirms or denies this entire realm. However, some ulama have derived implicit evidences. So for example, in Surah An-Nisa, verse 69. Those who obey Allah and His Messenger shall be with the ones whom Allah has favored. The Nabiyyin, the Siddiqeen, the Shuhada, and the Salihin, and what a great companionship. What a great group to be with. Ibn al-Qayyim writes in his book, Kitab al-Ruh, that this being with the group is something that occurs in this world and in the Barzakh and in Jannah. And that is because a person is with those whom he loves. And other scholars as well have derived from the verse of Ali Imran. Don't think the ones who have died in the way of Allah are dead. No, they are alive with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are looking forward to the good news, to the bashara from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are waiting for those that lam yalhaqu bihim. They haven't yet come to them. The fact that they're anticipating the next group that hasn't yet arrived indicates what? That they are going to meet the arwah. So this is, I would say, a very good indirect evidence for this regard. However, both of these evidences deal with meeting with the arwah of the dead. So this is a very clear indirect indication. However, there is an explicit hadith that solves this issue narrated from Abu Hurair radiallahu ta'ala an, when the time of death comes for the believer, that the malaika of mercy come, the malaika say, come out We've done all of this. They will go up. They will come down. The angels will praise them. The angels will say, what beautiful perfume. Then, this is a phrase I did not do when we began because I wanted to delay it here. Then, they will bring this new ruh to the arwah of the believers. So, the new soul will meet the soul of the believers. When the believers meet this newcomer, they are happier than when one of you receives a longer awaited visitor coming back from a journey. Suppose your son has gone, your mother has gone, your daughter has gone, your wife has gone. When they come back, you are so happy. The Prophet ﷺ said, the believers are happier when they see their new friend, the new mu'min coming from this world that they haven't met for 
so long, they are happier than this. So the arwah of the dead. They ask him about what happened with so and so. What happened with so and so. So they want to hear the news of what's happening in this dunya. The new mayit, the newly dead person we should say, is going to update the others about what has happened with so and so. Some of them will say, let him rest. He has just exited the misery of this world. Then the mayyit will say, you asked about so and so. The person you asked me about, he's already dead. Hasn't he come here? Where is he? And they say, oh, this means he has gone down there, not up here. And this is an indication that the one who goes to Adab al Qabr is disconnected from speaking and talking, which is totally understandable. They don't have the luxuries of meeting and interacting and greeting. That is for the believers. That is for the arwah of the salihin, of the awliya, of the muttaqin. And then the hadith goes on about the kafir and the adab that comes after him. Will the souls of the righteous go to sleep or will they be awake? And I mentioned this, that in reality we do not know. There is one and only one narration in which the soul is told, go ahead and sleep and it will fall into a sleep until the day of judgment. How do we reconcile this with the hadith I just mentioned? That they're going to be interacting with the people who come. Allah knows best. If someone were to say, hypothetically, that they are active for a time frame and then they are told to go to sleep. In the end of the day, we do not know and it is a different paradigm and our minds cannot understand the time and how time takes place in the barzakh. But looking at the evidences, a possible interpretation is what I have said, that they will be active for a period of time from our dunya's perspective. And perhaps, perhaps the more iman they have, the more active they will be. Hence, the shaheed will always be alive and the prophet Prophets are alive in their graves. So perhaps to the level of their iman, they shall remain active as well in the barzakh before they are told to go to sleep. And this is for the righteous. As for the unrighteous, we know that they will be punished until the trumpet is blown. Every single ancestor of mine and yours from the time of Adam is right now in the Barzakh. And every single child of ours that is born or will be born until Qiyamah will enter that Barzakh. It is an inevitable reality. وَمِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ بَرْزَخٌ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ In front of them is that Barzakh until the day they are resurrected. The goal is that if we truly believe in the Barzakh, and inshallah all of us do, that we make sure that we get the best of the Barzakh, that we make sure that we are interacting with the Anbiya and the Salihin and the Shuhada and the Siddiqeen, that we make sure that our Qabr is a Rawdha min Riyadh al Jannah and not of the places of Jahannam, that we make sure that the Malaika of Rahmah come and they take us out gently and they make us covered up with the fragrances of Jannah. So this knowledge, it should bring about a change in our attitude, in our lifestyles. We should prepare for Malakul Maut. We should prepare for Barzakh. We should prepare for the Qabr. As our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I have not seen anything except that the Qabr is more terrifying for me than anything I've seen. Al Qabr is more terrifying and every one of us is going to be in that state. The goal of this knowledge is that it impacts us so that we prepare for that time and to also realize that as our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the Qabr is the first manzila from all the manazil al-akhirah. If the first manzila is good, the rest of the manazil will be good. And if the first manzila was not good, then the rest will be worse than that. So we need to prepare so that insha'Allah ta'ala, we have the best of the best at the time of our deaths and what will happen afterwards 